Hey guys, this is Phil Galfon for BlueFirePoker.com, and I'm excited to welcome you to the first episode in my series, Philosophy. Uh, since this is the first episode, I want to talk a little bit about what this series is. Essentially, it'll just be exploring concepts one at a time in depth, and uh, there won't be a common theme linking episodes together. They'll kind of just be things that I think about that... Uh, and not enough poker players are thinking about and we will uh, look at them one at a time kind of in different formats you know some will be lecture type videos others will include a lot of hand examples uh, in our replayer and we'll probably even have some live sessions um, you know some might some of these videos might be 10 minutes long if there's something that I can explain pretty quickly that I don't think people are thinking about the right way, and, uh, you know, others will take up to an hour, just depending on what the topic is and what I have to say about it. So, without further ado, let's get into the first episode, which is titled, When a Scare Card is Not a Scare Card. Today we're going to be looking at some spots where the board's gotten scarier for our marginal made hand, and although our absolute hand strength has gone down, in actuality, our hand strength uh, against our opponent's range has gone way up uh, as the cards come off. And the idea is basically that I don't think enough people really understand what they're representing and understand what their opponent is representing in some certain spots when the board changes quite a bit. And there it presents a lot of opportunities to make some very profitable call downs. Um, when your hand is not so good in terms of absolute hand strength, hand strength compared to all the possible hands out there, but is actually quite good uh, when compared to your opponent's range in actuality. So we'll just be going through a few hand examples in depth, and I hope you enjoy it. So our first hand here is against Tagbot. Tagbot is a Straightforward, uh, obviously tight aggressive player. He plays mid stakes through high stakes and has kind of a style that he's learned uh, kind of by the book. Um, I, by no means a bad player, but he's multi tabling. He's not going to be making very many super creative plays. He's not thinking too far outside the box. He's not going to be making any crazy bluffs or super thin value bets. Um, kind of guy that checks behind for bot pot control some of the time. Uh, things like that. I think you get the idea of what I'm talking about. So, uh, we have 6-5 suit in the big blind, and we elect to call. Um, the flop is 8-5-4, so we've got a middle pair and a gutter. And he c-bets. Uh, he's doing this with all his hands for the most part, and this is, I think, the most standard call in the world. I'm not going to really go into it too much. By the way, I made all my hand examples at 501k, uh, just because that's cooler. So, we check the turn uh, when it's Jack Spades, and he bets again. Let's talk about first uh, the hands that you'd be doing this with for value. Certainly, any kind of uh, two-pair hand, sets, straights, over-pairs. Um, and then hands like... Pretty much any eight. I give him credit to uh, for betting eight nine, eight seven, eight ten. Some of the time, at least, certainly queen eight plus. I think he's betting for value, and then any jack that he turned, um, which you know he pretty much has all the jacks that he raised preflop. Besides the occasional ace jack that he checks behind, so uh, he certainly can have a whole bunch of value hands, but uh, he also can have a whole lot of semi-bluff hands here. He has uh, the obvious ones, I guess, are any sp any spade draw that he turned, any open-ender, which is, I guess, 6-3 suited, 10-9, um, and, you know, the double gutters are 9-6, uh, 9-7, 10-7. Uh, I think he folds 6-deuce and deuce 3 pre-flop. Uh, and then uh, he's also firing with all his gutters. So that means ace-deuce, ace-three, um, 
queen 9, queen 10. And then he's also firing any 6 or any 7. And that's something that I, I kind of want to stop and point out. Whenever there's a one card gut shot on board, there are a huge chunk of hands in your opponent's uh, semi-bluffing range just due to that uh, that fact. I think people sometimes underestimate the amount of hand combos that, that there are when all you need is one card to make the draw. So he's actually got just a whole bunch of hand combinations here that are semi-bluffing. So I think our hand is good most of the time. Um, Obviously, all his hands have 10-plus outs, for the most part, but uh, we still are certainly going to call here. We also, if he does have a hand like Ace-Jack um, or Kings, we have some equity ourselves. And we, you know, there are a lot of things you can do on the river if you do river 6 or a 5 or a 7, um, but uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, river's a king, offsuit king. And that's a bit of a scare card. I actually meant to say on the turn that the jack is a bit of a scare card, too. And I don't think that he's going to uh, be firing the turn with hands like, you know, queen, deuce, suited, uh, non-spades, just because of the jack scare card hit. But I do think that uh, the jack is enough to make him want to continue with uh, almost all of his draws that we talked about there. So I think all of those are very much in his range, you know, like a... 90 plus percent of the time that he has those hands, he's going to be two barreling. Now the king hits, we obviously check, and he goes ahead and bets 35k into 40k, and so now we have our big decision. Um, as I said earlier, and you might be thinking, this is kind of a straightforward player, he's probably not going to be showing up with a ton of bluffs, you know, the king's a scary card... Um, and that's obviously the point of this video, is uh, when a scare card is not a scare card. And the King of Clubs is one of the least scary cards in the deck here. Now, I don't mean that he never hits the King, and uh, I don't mean that uh, he doesn't have many hand combos that beat us, but what I mean is the uh, your kind of non-super thinking player is going to view this as a scare card. And what that's going to make him do is continue with a lot of his draws that missed. Um, he's going to say, okay, well, I missed. Should I bluff? A scare card hit? Yes, I should. Because um, there's always that kind of conception that... Uh, or perception? Whichever it is. Um, I dropped out of college. Um, but there's always the thought that, you know, the pre-flop raiser has high cards in his range, high card hit, oh no, he has it. And, you know, we can't really have hit that king very often unless we, you know, it two paired us and we had him, like, king eight suited, king five suited, uh, whatever it may be. So he views it as a good card to bet. The reason that this card does not scare me at all, um, you know, first of all, I think I said this, but, you know, there are not many kings that hit. Obviously, king uh, king seven, king six, and then any, any king uh, with two spades. But um, other than that, he's not firing the turn with hands like King Queen, Ace King, King Ten, even if those are in his you know pre-flop and c-betting range, because he's not uh, he's just not the type of player that does that. He kind of plays this system that he's developed. You know, when when you don't turn any outs, uh, you usually don't two barrel. So uh, that's one reason that I that I am not too scared of it. And the main reason, the most important reason that I'm not very scared of it, is because is because when the king hits and he bets very close to pot, in a somewhat large pot, this actually takes a lot of other hands out of his hand range, hands that beat us. For instance, any eight is now not betting, and most jacks are going to be betting less. This type of player is not going to be betting uh, jack nine here for almost pot. He's just not the type of player to do that. You know, if he wants to get value out of a jack, which I think he's capable of, he'll bet something like 28k, um... I think ace-jack we can leave in his range, but um, for the most part, you know, he's not going to be betting the eights and the jacks, so that leaves us with rivered kings, which is not that many hands, and then all his straights uh, sets in two pairs, which, you know, still that's a whole bunch of hands, but um, not as many as you might think, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. 
And then we have to look at all the hands that missed. Basically, all the hands we talked about on the turn, all the gutters, every single gutter missed, every open ender missed, and the flush draws missed. Um, a lot of people only kind of think of a drawy board when there's, you know, jack-10, 7 with two spades on the flop, and then two diamonds by the turn. But a board like this is deceptively very drawy because of all the gutters involved. So, um, and all those bricked off. And uh, because of that, and because of the fact that I think he's going to use the king as an excuse to fire with pretty much all those hands missed, I think this is actually a somewhat standard call against this type of player. You know, when you have a type of player that's going to be value betting thinner with, uh, with his um, even maybe an ace-8 type hand, or a queen-8, and all of his jacks, he puts you in a tougher spot. You know, somebody who knows you can read the board like this and checks back occasionally... Also one who can fire the turn with hands like King Deuce with n no real outs. Um, although then he's firing the turn with a lot more hands. But you, you get the point that uh, I'm talking about against this kind of player, which is, you know, a player that you run into all the time, I would assume. Uh, he is not going to be... He's not going to be value betting often enough for this to be a fold, in my opinion. So I go ahead and call. And because I made up these hands, I win. And he had the 10-7 for the double gutter. And I actually ran some of these... Uh, I ran this through Poker Stove. Um, if you don't know Poker Stove, uh, it's a free program that you can check your equity against hands or ranges of hands on different boards. Uh, it's pretty cool. Although this was actually a frustrating one to run. But anyways, I put in all the hands I talked about. And I actually probably gave him the benefit of the doubt here. I gave him credit for being able to bet hands like Jack-9, Jack-10, um, Jack-7, again, on the river, which we kind of don't think he would bet like this. So we're actually being a bit pessimistic about our chances here. And then we gave him, you know, all the other hands we talked about. If you are looking here and you see a hand I missed or a hand I included that was, uh, shouldn't have been included, I'm sorry, but I just tried to do it in, like, five minutes. Uh, but it's pretty close. And you can see here that uh, we are good 60% of the time against that hand range. Now, in reality, we're not going to be good 60% of the time, uh, just because he is occasionally going to check behind. I shouldn't say occasionally. He's very often going to check behind with uh, some of the hands that missed. But, you know, against his turn betting range, we're doing so well on this river that he doesn't have to bluff all that often for our call to be correct. Actually... Uh, we only need to be good just over 30% of the time, uh, or about 30% of the time, to make this river call because of our pot odds. And um, so you can see, you know, he has 60% of his hands are bluffs. And your first instinct is probably to think, okay, well, if he bluffs half the time, that's 30%. But the actual math is that uh, you got to look at it as far as hand combinations. And if you look at this as rather than 60%, 60 out of 100 hands and 40 out of 100 hands, then you can see that he's uh, 60, 60 of the 100 hands are bluffing. And so if he takes away half of those, then 30 out of 70 hands are bluffing. Or, yes, 30 out of 70 hands are bluffy, bluffing. And the actual math is that he has to bluff a third of the time when he missed, which gets us down to 20 hand combinations versus 40 hand combinations. And that gives us two to one, which is, uh, you know, just more than enough to call. So even if he's only bluffing on this board when he missed a third of the time, we can go ahead and call. So I think this is a great example of times when the board, you know, in some people's eyes got scarier, but in mine got much less scary. My next hand is against Lagosaurus. And he is, as you might have guessed, very, very loose aggressive. He's the single most loose aggressive player that I've ever fake played against. He loves to bluff people, loves to push people off pots. Um, he does value bet kind of thin uh, to kind of balance uh, all his bluffs out, but certainly not thinly enough. He's a fairly decent thinking player, but anyone who uh, can see him for what he is uh, and can kind of understand his ranges, can pick him apart if they do it right. He does run over a lot of the weaker players, though. Anyways, I call him the big blind with pocket sevens, which I think is standard. I get in a lot of trouble 
uh, tough situations if I three bet a hand like this against a player like him. In flops, king four five, two diamonds. We have a diamond in our hand, uh, which is more important for us hitting a set on a non-flush turn than it is for uh, our backdoor flush draw. But it's actually not even that important. I don't know why I mentioned it. We check call, which is totally standard. I think there's not a whole lot to be said about it. There are other options, not folding. You could check raise uh, for, you know, to take them off of hands with outs. But I, I think the check call is the standard play. Anyways, the jack spades hits. That is not a good card for our range. In the last hand, we talked about uh, how a scare card hits that's not really a scare card. The jack of spades is a legitimate scare card because he's still value betting all his kings and. He's also now uh, has all of his jacks in his range. He's certainly value betting any jack. He's a strong enough player to do that. So I'm not happy about this card. Uh, the other thing it does is that it puts, uh, or it gives a lot of his hands more equity against my hand. So, you know, a ton of his hands have two overs, six outs, but now a bunch of them pick up another four to eight outs if they didn't already have it. So this is actually a very tough spot against most people. Because although you're good a decent amount of the time, it's not an overwhelming majority of the time. And the times you're not good, you don't have a ton of equity. He has outs to improve. And you also have reverse implied odds because you don't know which cards hit him. He's going to be able to kind of outplay you in position. Uh, against Lagosaurus, though, he's betting with 100% of his draws here. Any gutter he's betting with, uh, obviously any flush draw, open ender. But he's also betting a good amount of the time with total air. Uh, just hands like 9-8 offsuit he's betting this turn with a, more often than he's not betting it. So because of that and because of how many hand combinations there are that you know don't have us beat right now and uh, don't have a ton of outs, uh, we can call this turn, in my opinion. And you know we are going to get in tricky spots on the river, but that's the risk you take by being a good player. I uh, I checked the river, uh, which is the Ace of Diamonds. Pretty much the ultimate scare card. Uh, it completes the straight, it completes the flush draw from the flop, and it also completes, or uh, sorry, it also improves any ace to top pair. Uh, that legitimately improves a lot of his range. You know, when this river hits, um, I look down at my sevens, and I go, I'm probably you know, not even good against a random hand much over half the time. And uh, I checked to him, and he bets. That actually does change a little bit. Uh, kind of like the first example, this takes some of the hands that were beating us out of his range. He's not going to be value betting any jack on this river, uh, other than, you know, two pairs. So that actually is a decent amount of hand combinations. And he's also not going to be value betting his kings. Uh, he might value bet a hand like king-queen, king-10, but I would weight that fairly lightly just because of uh, how large he bet. I don't think he would bet that large that often with a hand like that. Um, and he might not bet at all, to be honest. Uh, certainly not with lower kings, weaker kings. Uh, he can obviously have two pair sets, uh, straight uh, flushes, and he can be value betting any ace. He value bet. He'd certainly play ace deuce this way uh, most of the time, in my opinion. So there are a bunch of hands that beat us. Um, but since we did take a, hu a decent chunk of the hands that beat us out of his range, uh, that's a good sign. And then we can also look at all the draws that missed, which uh, you know not that many hands like ten nine, uh, queen nine. <clears throat> Uh, six eight, seven eight, six seven, uh, deuce six, three six. I guess deuce three hit. Anyways, you get the idea. All of those missed, and also, you know, we said, and it's true, he's going to be firing the turn with hands like eight nine, uh, ten eight, things like that. Queen deuce even, just because he views the turn as a scare card. Now. Even though there are those bluffs in his range, the there are not that many more bluffs in his range than value betting hands. So in order for us to be able to call here, 
he has to be bluffing with his heir a pretty large percentage of the time. And the thing about this Ace of Diamonds and the type of player that Lagosaurus is, is that he is he is bluffing this river pretty near 100% of the time that he has air. I think when he uh, gets to this river with a hand like 10 high, he's going to fire it near 98, 99% of the time. Uh, he views this as the ultimate scare card, which it is, you know. He loves to bluff. It's the perfect opportunity to bluff. Uh, you know, the board got scarier and scarier for our for our sevens, which is actually, you know, a good chunk of our range. And so because of that, I think that we are able to call him. And I do go ahead and call. And he did have the 8-6 gutter. And I still think that, uh, like I said, hands like 9-8, 10-8, uh, queen, 7 are in his range. And I did run this through Poker Stove. It was pretty inexact just because we have to kind of guess how often he's firing turns with 10-8, things like that. I gave him 80% of hands pre-flop, and then I took out um, I took out all the hands that are that paired the first four cards, basically. So hands like 5-8, king-8, 8, jack-8, eight, and then other ones without 8 involved. But uh, And then I left in all the hands that I said he would value bet, and I did leave in all of the 8-10 queen-deuce type hands. So, we do have to take, we have to wait it so that some of those are removed. But, um, the thing about it is, he's firing the river with those hands all of the time. So, all that we have to account for is how often he is giving up on the turn with them. And, um, I didn't technically run all the math, but in my head, I think it's pretty clear that he's firing the turn enough of the time that we have the odds to call on this river. And,. It's just another example here where actually the scariest card in the deck became a card that let us call. Whereas if the river was uh, offsuit mm, eight, for instance, you know, one draw got there. Um, maybe even offsuit, let's say just a four. If a four hit, I think that we m might still be able to call probably against him actually, but it's not that much better of a situation or as good a situation as much of a better situation as you might think this hand is going to be a little bit different uh, first of all we're in position and we're a little bit deeper and also our opponent is not a good thinking player um, our last opponents have been you know different levels of pretty good uh, this guy is, you know, he's over aggro, and he's just kind of bad not thinking. He's certainly not value betting light enough to counteract the times that he's bluffing all the time, and he is just not very smart. Uh, I guess that's all I really need to say about him. So we have tens on the button, and we're going to raise, obviously. He calls. And uh, the flop's not great for our hand, but it's okay. And against a player like this, you know, I think there's... Uh, I guess I'm not even going to talk about c-betting. I think it's pretty standard c-bet against him. Uh, there's a lot of value in it. He goes ahead and raises. This is not good for us. Uh, we do have the best hand a lot of the time, but he has a good amount of equity with um, hands that are behind us usually, and we're going to have trouble putting him on a hand uh, when certain boards come off. Uh, it is a little on the smaller side, his check raise, you know, a little under 3x, and uh, we are in position and a bit deep, and I think we can kind of really narrow his range as we get more information about his hand. Uh, basically, it can outplay him. So, I go ahead and call. Now, the turn is a scare card, uh, quote-unquote, uh, King of Clubs. And this is a really good example of uh, when you're playing against a bad player, how, uh, a card that he will really overvalue as a scare card. Like so, so, so much. This is really, really a great card for us, actually. You know, it does improve a lot of his 
uh, hands like King X of Spades and you know the random King Jack, King Ten that he check raised. But uh, he's not going to be betting this turn for value with a queen now. He's he's not the type of player that's going to bet call Ace Queen or even Queen Jack, which actually uh, would be a good play just because of how aggressive he is. You know, so what we're actually looking at here uh, is very, very few value hand combinations. We're looking at a set of eights, a set of sixes, queen eight, queen six, um, occasionally a king eight, definitely king queen, and then the kings that he kind of just backed into here. So, against that range, we're actually, I mean, obviously against uh, all those ends, we're not doing well at all, but the, he also has uh, a whole ton of draws. I don't even think I need to go into how many draws are on this board. Gut shots, open enders, flush draws, there are just a ton of them. And occasionally he will just have like an ace nine that check raise just because and bet the turn because it's a scare card. And I think that when he does have his uh, bluff hands, his semi bluff hands, especially the weaker ones, he is going to be betting this king of clubs uh, scare card turn a lot. I think that some of the times he'll check some of the time I'll check with uh, like a flush draw just because he's afraid of getting shoved on so I think we can discount um, flush draws some of the time but uh, we call to see the river and the river is a queen of clubs this is kind of another perfect example of the type of card that will hit that will cause a bad loose aggressive player to bluff way too much and not value bet thinly enough. He is not value betting this river now with a king. He he puts us on a queen, you know, a lot of the time. And if we don't have a queen, we have a missed draw or occasionally a hand like we have that in his eyes, you know, might have folded the turn and would be hard pressed to call the river, even though we actually uh, are very clearly going to call this river. When you look at uh, his value hands, also the queen takes out a few combinations of uh, queen six and queen eight and king queen, just because now there are only two queens left in the deck for him to have. So we're only looking at now queen eight, queen six, king queen, eight eight, and six six. That is it. Those are the only hands he's taking this line with for value. So if he bluffs, you know, a few hand combinations. This is a really easy call, and actually I ran this through poker stuff, I'm not going to show you, but uh, against somewhat reasonable range, we're actually good here, 80% plus on the river, and uh, I just, I mean, I, this, you know, looking at that, it might seem like this is a really simple hand, and obviously we call, but I wanted to point it out, because it is such a simple hand, and if you're, if you're folding in spots like this, you're causing yourself a lot of money against bad players, and I think... Some people in my spot will look at the board and think it got scarier and just be like, okay, I'll wait and find a better spot with my, you know, I'll fold my tens, wait and find a better spot to get my money in. When this is actually a fantastic spot to get a lot of money in. So we call, and he did have a gutter, and we scoop a nice pot. And this thing was, you know, an example of a fairly easy call. And uh, I wanted to show you guys that, you know, I made the first two hand examples a little bit tougher because I thought you guys would like to see how to navigate a, a close, tough situation. But the truth is, in those close situations, you're not making that much money by calling or folding. Uh, so I was thinking about uh, if there are members out there that didn't really understand the concept of the third hand, they're costing themselves a ton of money. And so I wanted to really point that out and drive home the idea of times when your opponent is, you know, taking a very aggressive line and the board changes, times when you have to look at uh, the range of value hands as well as semi-bluffs, bluffs that he had on the flop, and then how they connect with the later streets and how we'll play them. Uh, on the flop in that last hand, you know, he could check raise a ton of queens, for sure. And then on the river, he would bet all of his queens. He would shove them. But he doesn't get to the river that way because of the turn. And because of the turn and the way we know our opponent plays, we can eliminate a huge chunk of the hands that are beating us from his range. So 
I just wanted to, you know, drive home a couple concepts before we go. The idea that you need to be thinking about draws that are not the obvious draws, you know, the obvious draws being flush draws and open enders. Uh, gut shot straight draws actually make up a huge amount of hand combinations, a huge chunk there, uh, especially when there's a one-card gutter on the board like we talked about. And, you know, you also just have to be thinking nonstop about what your opponent's repping. And as scare cards hit, it causes, uh, or it creates a unique opportunity for you to get some information about his hand, because a lot of opponents will not play uh, board-changing cards uh, very well. And they'll kind of give you, give away the strength of their hand um, by checking when a scare card hits that scares them, uh, betting when a scare card hits that uh, improve them or when a scare card hits that they want to bluff on. But, it, you know, they don't think about the fact that uh, certain scare cards are very unlikely to improve them. So, uh, and you should also be thinking about, you know, in their spot against a tough player uh, when it's right to represent hands and when it's not. And I think we, I think that uh, you can kind of infer that from the hand examples we talked about. So, I guess that's been it. And uh, thanks for watching the first episode of Philosophy. This is Phil Galfon for BlueFirePoker.com.